Hello and welcome to April. Um, I'm going to be doing a March wrap up. Um, so, as you know, last month, before March, February, February <laughs> I only read one book. Yeah. And even that was a bit of a cop out because it was really half a book. Um, it was just like one collection of poetry in a collection. So, uh, what I did is I did a wrap up of things films, music. Um, uh, but this month I've read more books, but I'll still do a, a, a wrap-up of things. Um, so I'll start off with running through all the books that I read, and then I'll do a bit of a highlights, sort of films, music, other stuff. Because um, I enjoy doing these videos. So, um, the books. I read um, eight books uh, this month, so it's an improvement. Um, I started off with um, Erica Young's first collection of poetry. This is called uh, Fruits and Vegetables. That's Erica. So I think this is from like 1969 or 1970. Let's have a look. No, 1968. Initially. So it's, it's her first collection of poems. I really enjoyed this collection. I thought it was great. Um, yeah, it's definitely sort of the uh, sort of early. You can sort of feel the stirrings of second wave feminism in this, and I know that Erica Young, um, her *Fear of Flying* the novel was kind of quite a sort of uh, you know a cultural iconic feminist uh, book in the seventies, which she wrote um, after a few of her poetry collections. Lots of poems about uh, being a woman in America in that sort of countercultural moment, late sixties. Um, there's lots about food. I struggle um, as a, you know, someone with a bit of a fruit phobia reading about fruits and some vegetables, uh, I've got to be honest. Um, and there's poems that are kind of written in a, almost like a post-beat sort of style that sort of seem to be sort of moving towards something new, that sort of um, 70s, um, what is it, confessional, um, honest kind of poetry, it's sort of the... Uh, you know how like in music like the singer songwriter movement became sort of big in the 70s I think that sort of similar thing happened in poetry that it became quite um, about the person and it's sort of quite confessional but I enjoyed that collection um, and then I read um, where should I put it here or here we'll see Pretty Things by Janelle Brown this was a thriller um, a pretty standard thriller I think it was about a a young woman who is a bit of a con artist, um, along with her partner, sort of boyfriend slash sort of uh, con partner. They <laughs> call you my con partner. Con partner, yeah. yeah. She, she tends to target um, social media like Instagram influencers. Um, so wealthy, rich uh, young people. She'll sort of get into their lives, steal a few things from their homes, and then sort of move on. Um, often isn't, like, caught because, you know, like, the super wealthy don't really notice a few things missing, or they're too moneyed, like, with too much of a sort of a socialite family background to sort of report things to the police. So, you know, it doesn't really bother them, they let it go. So she's sort of doing this, and then she really needs money because her mum is um, dying, her mum has cancer and she needs all these medical treatments so she needs to have like one big job and um it sort of then goes back to um her teenage years where she sort of got in with the son of this sort of wealthy family and, and like how she was mistreated by them and stuff so she's out to get revenge as well as rip them off a bit and it's sort of multiple perspective it's very clever when you when books do this you know i think but this is quite a chunky book and I think a lot of it was basically just saying the same scene from one person's perspective and then like the other person's perspective so much of that was pretty much just rereading the same thing twice with a really obvious kind of different perspective kind of shift um lots of twists it was fine um I think like a holiday read like if you're just wanting um something you can dip in and out of it's fine it's glamorous um I don't know it's, it's it's a bit silly, but it was fine. Yeah. Yeah. You started off liking it, I think. Yeah. I, these things for me, like, you know, like how I like trashy films. I'm willing to, to spend a bit of time in that world, but I'm not willing to spend, like, a week 
reading the same trashy book, which is because I'm a slow reader, does happen. So I'm quite envious of like people that can pick up these books, you know, just read them in a couple of days. And I think that's how they're supposed to be consumed. Yeah, but but for me, I'm just stuck with yeah. them for a long yeah. time, you know. So that makes sense. Because yeah. I quite like reading one of those sort of books in a day or something. Yeah, just yeah, and yeah. And I think that's what yeah. it's supposed to be yeah. like. So it's my fault, really. Oh. Um, and then after that, I read uh, "Nobody Is Ever Missing" by Catherine Lacey. This book bugged me a bit, um, as I have talked about, I think, possibly in a, in a vlog or something, but. It's about a woman that is kind of running away from her life. She's a, you know, a young woman having an ex existential moment. Um, I, I think she's like struggling to find meaning in her life. So she just kind of starts hitchhiking. She goes, travels to New Zealand, I think, and starts hitchhiking to get to this place where she was invited to sort of come stay for a while. Um, it, the writing didn't work for me I felt it, I, you know when you can see through the writing and you can sort of see the author thinking of what they're doing with the writing I had that a lot with this book I, uh, the sentences were like really self-consciously long in a sort of stream of conscious way it's supposed to be stream of conscious but it didn't work for me it didn't feel authentic it felt very much writerly it felt very kind of contrived um, and I didn't really get a sense of anyone in the book be feeling real they all felt like you know say say what you will about a thriller like pretty things they it's a, there's a story there and so like that story has potential to sort of say a lot about human uh motives or you know like the you know uh, motivations and uh psychology and stuff like that but i think what happens with a lot of people that think they're a bit smarter than those books when they come to write a book, they have no story. They just think they can do it on vibes, you know, and they just think I, I've got, you know, I, I'm going to write about a sad woman. Um, and yeah, it just feels like filler. And then I read Nighttime is the Right Time by Mary Higgins Clark. <laughs> Nighttime is my time, not the right time. <laughs> I prefer that. <laughs> by Mary Higgins Clark. I get three stars because this was solid. You know, it was so formulaic and kind of crap, but, it's everything I wanted. Um, so, Sunday nights we started watching um, Mary Higgins Clark thrillers. They're I, often I from. I feel like I've just been tripped into it. I don't know how it's become a Sunday night. Right, thing. Yeah, it's become a Sunday night <laughs> tradition. At least this month. We've watched three, haven't we? Yeah. Um, I think we've watched four now. Oh, we've watched four. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and they're often like early two thousands, quite sort of made for TV, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I thought, I'll, I'll read one of the books, you know. So I was quite enjoying them. And this this particular book was set in a school reunion, which I love that setting. And it's sort of set over a period of just a few days. Um, so we've got this sort of central character that's going back to the school reunion, going back to their old hometown. And then it's got kind of a group of, like, the success stories from that school who are being honoured. Um, and... There's a serial killer going around, kill, knocking off the people that sat on this one um, uh, table in the cafeteria <laughs> when they were at school. Because he was mocked by them when he was performing um, in the school play. He stuttered. Yeah. Um, we don't know who this is, obviously, because uh, we'd know who the killer was out of this cast of uh, characters. Um, but... He overheard him, them mocking his performance during the school play. So he's been killing them slowly over the period of 20 <laughs> years. <laughs> the kids have got over that, didn't they? Meanwhile, he's just killing random people as well. Yeah. Just to get his fix, you know. But I, My recommendation is to get over it and not bother going back to the reunion. Yes. So is it like, you know, the 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 comedian that's going back? Or is it the real estate mogul? Is it the successful psychologist? It's like you know the cast of characters. It was it was it was really short chapters, which I loved. You could just like read a chapter, I read another chapter. Good stuff, Mary Higgins Clark. Um, and then I read a Serenade by Bill Berkson. This is um, like a collection. Uh, gathers together most of his poetry and extended prose from 1975 to the end of the 1980s. Bill Berkson's one of those sort of figures that um, came about from me sort of reading that um, Bolinas 
collection of poetry on the Mesa. So he was one of the, from that scene of, of writers. Um, I enjoyed this. It had real sort of real great moments in it. And it's got um, illustrations kind of throughout by the great and wonderful Joe Brainerd. They're very sort of simple little drawings. They're lovely. Um, so it's mostly poetry. Um, and it has some sort of extended sort of prose bits. And I think like what was happening, like I was saying uh, about that sort of what happened in the 70s, was I think poetry got quite sort of um, inward looking. People are looking at the sort of minute details of their own lives, almost like the mundane sort of domestic. Um, and it's also that um, movement which seemed to be sort of about capturing, almost like recording everything, like the minute details of like your everyday life almost like a, just keeping this record of it and I think a lot of that is this and a lot of the prose pieces just feel like almost like every thought that, he, that comes to his, into his head um, and you know any like little event that would happen in the day or something that he sees when he looks out so it, it's not great fun to read it's very dense the weather in Roysdale or Trenton the great trade route sunshines five miles inland in another direction guys on a cherry picker from the overhanging cypress slash eucalyptus branches and the wires hum so yeah um i can see why i can see that tendency like to record your life in that way and like to re almost to record the movements of your thought and get it all down i think it's an interesting practice whether or not it makes interesting reading um maybe amongst your group of friends you know or your in your scene it might do but i think uh, detached from that, it feels a little bit navel gazy, I, I suppose. Yeah, I feel really snuffly over here. A snuffle bum. Yeah, like allergies. Oh my god, it's allergy season. Right. What's next? <coughs> so, yeah, I gave that three and a half stars anyway because there were little moments of like you know, great like, lines and stuff like that. Next up, um, did really well this month. Thank you. Yeah. Alright, de detransition baby. Yay. Wonderful. Um, so I read this um, to just be involved in the Trans Rights Readathon. We still have the um, donation link up. I'll post it down below. sean has been great at doing this whole thing. Yay. She's responsible for it really. But I thought I would just read uh, this during the time of that uh, readathon as well. I don't really, it's difficult to talk about this book, it just felt so accomplished, it was so brilliant. Um, so at first it took me a little while to get into it because I think like I was struggling to care, I think, about the characters and also, you know, like a book about, uh, you know, having a baby. But it's not a book I would ever read, but I just felt like there's so much depth to everything that's going on. I mean, just structurally how it's done, how, and I, I, kind of, I, I kind of assumed that this would be a chronological novel of you know um this situation where there's a uh a guy that's detransitioned um who makes who, who's having a, a relationship with his boss who is a cis korean woman um she gets pregnant um he doesn't think he can make anyone pregnant because of the uh, transition and he is struggling to i think um know how to uh, a parent, how, how he would be a parent. He doesn't want to be a father in that traditional sense. He can't see himself as that because he kind of um, still sees himself as a, a woman in a lot of ways. Um, so he gets in touch with his ex, who he was having a relationship with when he was living as a woman. Um, his his ex is um, a great character. She's like um, always wanted a child, um, and it's uh, it bring and it's just sort of that sort of dynamic, just brings up all of these um, fascinating questions, you know. And it's sort of such a book of our times. It feels like such a cultural moment. It's sort of like it deals with so much, and it, it almost and yet it, it feels like a novel at the same time. It doesn't feel like we're being taught anything or being like. It just feels like through the 
processes of thinking about this situation um, and living it through these various characters, we're being confronted with all of these different issues that um, that they that they're confronting. So yeah, it's it's just it's brilliant. It's almost like too much to talk about in a quick spiel. Um, yeah, I'd really be interested. I think this is going to date really well. I think it'd be interesting to also see how as you know in 20 years time what a book like this reads like i think it's going to be a real time capsule um i, I do feel like it says so much about this moment um and it's just great like so many like um i love how it sort of really sort of it digs deep um it never does the obvious thing it it steers away from cliche it doesn't tell you what you want to what you know it none of these characters are stereotypes None of these characters sort of fit into like um, an idea you have in your head. Great, Tori Peters is great. Beautifully so, okay. done, Bobby. Oh, thank you. Um, William Blake versus the World by John Higgs. Um, I mentioned John Higgs. Um, he's written one of my all-time favourite biographies, the one of Timothy Leary. I have America surrounded, which is from our early days. Um, uh, I, I, I read it's it. My book, wasn't it. Yeah. yeah. Um, Brilliant, such a brilliant biography. Obviously, I haven't read it for about you know over ten years, I'd, I'd say, but it really has left a mark with me. So I didn't realise that when I picked this up, this was that the same author. But he's done it again. Uh, this is great. So fascinating. Um, William Blake is such a fascinating character. So um, out of his own time. Um, so difficult to like fully get a grasp on. So obviously, he was um, an artist, poet. Um, and his work is still, I think, being unravelled. Like we're sort of still trying to sort of work out exactly what he was trying to say, where he stood. Um, but just a fascinating human being, really. I really recommend this book just to get to grips a little bit with. Because I think in our culture, in Britain, you know, I think William Blake is is kind of revered in a way that that is fully kind of misunderstanding what he stood for in the sense of you know like Jerusalem is kind of you know our unofficial national anthem it's sung by like, politicians and uh, you know in Eton or, like all the colleges and stuff and it's a, very much a revolutionary poem about overthrowing institutions about the power of the imagination over um, bureaucracies and institutions and the government and uh, and I think in, in that same sense of of just that little element of William Blake, I think he's often just misunderstood in general. Um, and I think that's because his, his writing is so complicated, um, which explains, I think, why he's best known for the um, songs of innocence or songs, songs of experience, because those are his most easily accessible and kind of um, they are what they say they are kind of works. Um, and so it's really, really interesting to read um, about as someone going more into depth of his more mythological works, his stuff on sort of Milton and um, writing about the Zoas, which are sort of the four elements of um, the human psychology. This is very much like an exploration of like myth itself and of various sort of belief systems of like reality itself. And I think like once you understand more of the context of the work, you realise how out of the norm his stuff was and this is way before you know um psychology was a thing this is way before people were like even kind of thinking about the subconscious william blake was writing whole mythologies around it fascinating and i finished off the month well actually i'd sort of been listening to the audiobook through the month but i did finish off breath by james nestor uh, which in a lot of ways I found quite helpful and um, quite fascinating, and in a lot, a lot of other ways, I just thought it was a bit rubbish. Um, I guess any book which kind of reminds you to um, breathe <laughs> in a in a correct way is helpful. So you know, I became quite hyper conscious of um, breathing through my nose whilst reading this book, and I still am finding myself sort of if I wake up in the night or if I'm sort of going to sleep uh, of like trying to stop myself breathing through my mouth um, and breathe through my nose that's the, the, the central point of this book is breathe through your nose um, obviously there's like lots of traditions 
which advised you to do that for like thousands of years from different cultures and it also has you know some breathing techniques so that like kind of yeah. yeah um most people do breathe through their nose though. most people do and but, i wasn't and aware of that until you know i wasn't aware that i I wasn't, and then I thought, am I? And then you I thought, I, I am. Yeah. yeah. But I think the only people who aren't breathing their nose usually just because their nose is blocked. Could be. <laughs> I don't know. I had a sense from this book of like it being quite <laughs> colonial uh, in its mindset. Like yes, it's, it's, there's sure. this guy, this American guy, who wants to get to the bottom of his own breathing thing. So what does he do? He sort of takes little bits from different cultures, doesn't yeah. really immerse himself in any of them or get a full understanding of them. He meets up with you know a couple of like specialists. And it's that real sense of like, I'm going to take all this stuff and then I'm going to show you what I've learned, which is like the culmination of all knowledge about breathing, rather than just be like, be humble about it and um, acknowledge like this, this, this teaching or something. But it's a real sense of like grabby, you know, like thing. I'm going to try all these different things almost as an experiment, be quite com competitive with it. And like Sean says, it has that sort of Joe Rogan sort of energy, sort of bro science stuff. Um, but I guess you can read it and take what you want from it. I've taken that I need to sort of focus a little bit more to try and sort of breathe from my nose and uh, chew more. <laughs> That's pretty much all you need to know. I always resent them because what's the, what's the, the um, subtitle of that? The New Science of a Lost Art. See, yeah. I mean, I, there's so many books like that, aren't they? Yeah. But it is just that thing of like, like you're saying, isn't it? This stuff is already out there. Yeah. It, there's yeah. A, I've got masses of books yeah. behind me about... I think about breathing. Yeah, I think it's got a good sort of question, sort of culturally where we are, like in terms of like, you know, processed foods and stuff being like really easy to chew and things like that, and like how our ancestors would have spent hours a day chewing. So like we had like this kind of quite good jaw structure. We sort of were developing like a uh, bone in our skulls, which we can still do through our lives. But so, but Western science does tell us that everything just sort of degenerates through our lives, but it's not true. Right. <laughs> Two stars. <laughs> uh, those are the books. Do you want to hear some more stuff? Or what are you done there? No, I don't yeah? want to hear some more, uh, stuff. More, more stuff. I feel like a little bit snuffly, like almost am I unwell? Did you go out in the rain, didn't you? Yeah. Would you like to hear about some film highlights? So, once again, I'm not going to talk about just my favourite films that I watched. I'll talk about things that I think are noteworthy, that might have a bit of a conversation going um earlier on in the month i did discover cecilia condit who i had previously watched um a short film by called possibly in michigan i rewatched it and it sort of led me down a bit of a rabbit hole of some of her other short films from the 80s and she's still doing them cecilia Cond condit is like uh, this great video artist uh, makes short films possibly in Michigan is like kind of what she's best known for I just love this short film so much it's so unnerving so weird so um, funny but disturbing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this one here smells great which one mm -hmm. smells like mother's crazy sister Kate oh you think so yeah I do I advise everyone to watch it go on YouTube possibly in Michigan it's like 11 minutes something long um, amazing it's really inspiring um, so that sort of has really caught me things like that inspire me quite a lot and make me want to sort of write and sort of create stuff are you um, writing a book at the moment I'm writing a book at the moment <laughs> What is the book you're writing at the moment? I'm currently writing my second official collection of poems, which will be out in uh, around October next year. Next year, 2025. So I'm in the process of writing that. And as a result of... And because I'm writing that, I'm trying to immerse myself in the kind of stuff that gets my mind busy, which a lot of the time it seems to be like 80s video art, 70s performance art, sort of feminist art, performance art, dance, um, instructions of things yeah. I quite I, I quite find. Um, and like, um, Your corner, essentially. Stuff like that. <laughs> meditation, um, yeah. tapes, old guided meditations, stuff like that. They just, for some reason, that sort of puts me in the, the right frame of mind for writing. Um, and we watched The Irish Wish. <laughs> which is... 
<laughs> not a fun thing to say. Irish wish. Irish wish. Remember on um, 30 Rock, remember they have the John Grisham novel, um, The Rural Jura? Um, and they're like throughout, they're just sort of struggling to say Rural Jura. And it's very much Irish wish is the same thing. It's Lindsay Lohan. She's uh, having a comeback, as you all know, in a Hallmark style. Um, thoughts on Irish Wish? Um, it was okay. It was okay. I mean, it's dreadful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Obviously. Yeah, obviously. but it was fun. I enjoyed it. I think I preferred the Christmas movie, yeah. to be honest. Yeah, I'm not sure. So she, for an Irish film, there isn't that many Irish people in it, for starters. No, even the Irish guy was English, wasn't he? And they're doing an accent. Yeah, and then like the main love interest was also English. Um, so yeah, Lindsay Lohan in Ireland, just like talking about James Joyce and doing <laughs> jigs in the, in the country pub. <laughs> we did like our outfits, didn't we? Great outfits. Yeah. I mean, that's a highlight for me. Yeah. Is the, the the outfits. It just felt like almost like subpar for a Hallmark. Yeah. Film, but just like because it's got Lindsay Lohan, it's going to have way more viewers, and I like that for Lindsay. I think it's almost worse going. Like it would have been better. Because you've got to then deal with the whole Irishness of it. Yeah. The you know the bad yeah. fake Irishness. America it's just better I- if you just stayed where you were. Yeah, <laughs> I find like America does Ireland so badly. Like it, it really wants. Like in the same way that it wants England to be, lots of royals, um, drinking tea and yeah, and speaking like uh, four weddings and a funeral. They want Ireland to just be like people dancing jigs in in pubs and drink at Guinness. Drinking Guinness and talking about poetry, and mm-hmm. anyway, as a result of that, I did rewatch Mean Girls this month <laughs> um, to sort of see where it all began with Lindsay, and that film's dated so badly. I know, but this is quite sort of an important film for lots of people, and I watched it at the time, and I don't think I sort of paid much attention to it. But I've always kind of in my mind thought, oh yeah, I really like Mean Girls. It's really sort of racist and misogynistic. Um, and for a film like like the whole point of the film is like what we learn is that, that we t- sort of treat everyone with respect like no matter what they look like or you know where they're from but it sort of does that from a whole film where we're sort of mocking fat people or people with you know facial hair or you can't have like a whole film where we're supposed to laugh at, at, at these people and then tell us at the end to like be uh, really respectful of them you know I suppose it's just in amongst those type of films at the time yeah, they're not even the toxic, doing that uh, to- toxic early 2000s yeah so like if you just imagine watching it of that in mm. that time and space then mm. it is like you said it's not dated well and now you know and I think they they were doing the, like they've changed it when they've done like the musical recently mm. haven't they and, mm. and I think you know it very much had that mean girl thing which now I really love in films we've moved away from yeah. The n- bitchy blonde girl, yeah. haven't we? You know, yeah. Now it's like. Yeah, like that. It's become a trope that has yeah. now been like inverted. Yeah. Kinda. Yeah. It's, uh, Old School April is coming at the right time for me because I'm, I'm sort of dipping back in in, in time quite a lot. And I sort of re- re- revisited um, Dead Poet Society. Oh, gosh. This yeah. month. Wonderful. I loved that film growing up. It's still, you know, if anything, it hits me harder now. <laughs> As soon as Mr. Keating just appeared on screen, I was like, started tearing up. Go on, lean in. Listen. You hear it? They talk about yeah. poetry, bits oh, and tears. <laughs> I don't like, you know, the, the guy. No spoilers. <laughs> go and watch. If you haven't seen Dead Poets Society, please go watch it. The bit that's more obviously sad. Yeah, the bit that's more bother, obviously sad. Bother you, didn't it? I guess like it bothered me more the first time I watched yeah. it, but I know that's going to happen now. But I think like the stuff about poetry and life and like really like seizing the day just it still gets me. Like an, I'm still like a. a a teenager like feeling that when I watch it and Robin Williams is so good in it yeah it's a great film and did it make you want to be a poet as well I think things like that probably did get into my head as a young person you know I think that the My So Called Life episode with the uh, substitute teacher they all kind of inspired me you know when I was growing up so 
and you know it's so weird now watching a film like Dead Poets Society we were really rooting for these privileged white rich kids you know in a yeah, way yeah, that yeah. feels actually quite genuine and yeah. sort of almost quite radical because yeah. we would never make a film like that now but this gives them I guess you know like because it's set in the 60s it almost feels like it, there's enough distance there for us to not have all those uh, connotations that we would put on those kind of people now. Yeah, there's just one girl in it, isn't it? And she's yeah. rubbish. Yeah, well, there's a few, but they're not. <laughs> yeah, it's very much a boys yeah. sort of club film. Uh, great. It was great, yeah. I watched Days of Thunder, lads. Oh, oh yeah, it's twice. This, uh, twice, it's from <laughs> 1990. Two reasons for this. Um, one reason was, as I was sort of discussing a little bit, I discovered Maria McKee. Uh, this month. Uh, it's weird how these things happen, isn't it? Um, so I, I, I sort of got into Maria McKee um, and then I realised that, okay, she, she's the one that did the, that song um, Show Me Heaven, which is on the soundtrack, which was like, the, the, you know, the, the only sort of big song she ever did, which was huge at the time, um, which is on the soundtrack to Days of Thunder. And then Days of Thunder just came up on, um, I think it's is it on Prime or something like that. So had to be done and it was one of the few films you know the Tom Cruise films from that sort of peak Tom Cruise era that I hadn't seen uh, before so I, I watched it it's a strange film have you seen it it's um it's a, he's a, like a motor race car driver <laughs> um stuff about racing it's a racing film Nicole Kidman that's where they met to be honest I didn't really watch it no I just was yeah. in the room for some of it. Yeah. But it, but also we watched that episode of Poker Face, which has which has a, a yeah, racing, racing. and yeah. now they've blended. <laughs> they have blended. It's weird though; they're both at the same time. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I miss Nicole Kidman's curly hair. I have to say, but uh, Tom Cruise, interesting. Uh, it's interesting to watch those films now. I think like this is something I was thinking about quite a lot in the month. Um, was like how like a film like that which I would have avoided in, in its time in the same way that I avoid lots of films that are the big blockbuster films now. I think over time they become interesting because they sort of somehow kind of, they like encapsulate something about that moment in time, like all the, the you know, the zeitgeisty things, all the, the, the cool trends or the whatever. They just have, they embody a time so much that in hindsight you get something completely different in watching those films than you would have done at the time. So I enjoyed it, I watched it again. But Sean did mention Poker Face. So Poker Face has been yeah. the highlight of the month for me. Um, I, I showed you last time that we were, I got it, didn't oh, I? Oh, yeah, okay. And we've been watching Poker Face. It's brilliant. We've only got one episode left. Um, our favourite episode, is our joint favourite episode, was uh, Rest in Metal. Oh, of course, you yeah, were Chloe Savini. Chloe yeah. Savini, um, as they're like fronting this uh, kind of, they're doing a kind of, a kind of a nostalgia tour metal band. Um, but it's so great. You can sort of definitely see this sort of Columbo influence. Natasha Leon is brilliant. Can't can do no wrong. No, I'm completely in love with her. She's amazing. Yeah. Um, great hair. Yeah. Love this whole show. Um, and love all the sort of special guests and stuff. They've all been really great. And each episode is so different. And I love. This is what I've been crying out for for years. Standalone episodes. <laughs> Why can't there be more things? Why do we have to like have? A program which, like, if, if you watch your episode, you have to have watched everything that went before, and, well, and then I carry think on. often though that they do start off as standalone, like something like mm. Buffy started off standalone mm. more or less, didn't it? But yeah. then as it goes along, they have yeah. to add. So, but I don't know, think anything now starts off as standalone. No, they all start no. off with the idea of like yeah. we can make this as long, you know all the yeah. characters. I love this as standalone. You can just like remember an episode. I love that episode. I'll go and watch it, and that's it. Yeah. Like a most she wrote. Yeah. Um. We, last night was it last yeah. night we, no ni a couple of nights ago we watched Martin 1977 yeah. vampire film George Romero really gritty grimy I enjoyed it uh, gory yeah Sean really enjoyed it I knew she'd enjoy that um, <laughs> I thought it was great as well quite sad um, and quite disturbing sort of definitely trigger warnings um, it has a sort of real kind of yeah gritty r realness to it um, but it's an interesting take on the whole vampire thing I like vampires. Yeah. The other horror film that stood out for me this month was Smile from 2022. We finally went, got around to watching that. I thought this was really good. I thought it went a little bit overboard at the end. But, um... Do you know what, though? I'm kind of quite into things that go overboard. I read, like... <laughs> it's definitely a thing at the moment, Yeah, isn't it? like a couple of no, like horror novels I've read recently. Mm. 
they just like going along and then they have this completely wild ending yeah and, uh, it's, a, it's an of, interesting think, trend yeah why not isn't it yeah who's the um actor in it um it's kevin bacon's daughter yeah something bacon so see so, bacon yeah I thought she was great in it. Uh, yeah, really interesting film. It's in the lineage of it. Fo- it follows, so I think it follows was quite sort of pivotal, and you know, it sort of created this sort of thing of like something you pass on to someone else, like this horror that you pass on, and then that person pass on. It's kind of this whole kind of like chain letter of this kind of horror. I thought it was good. I don't think a lot of people uh, they got got quite low ratings on Letterbox, but I thought it was really good. And then finally, for movies, Clock Watchers from nineteen ninety seven. Uh, with Parker Posey, Lisa Kudrow, Tony Collette. Tony Collette, really good cast, and it's just set in this kind of. It's about temps working in this office. Um, it's you know about the sort of mundane nonsense work, um, uh, clock watching kind of jobs, and uh, it's good. It's really good. Very familiar with Parker Posey was brilliant in it. She's always great, isn't she, Parker Posey? She, she steals the show. She's got a great wardrobe throughout. Um, I just thought it was a really interesting sort of non-deservedly forgotten film from that era. It seemed small enough. We didn't know what it meant at the time. Didn't change our routine. Sort of seemed to sort of almost sort of predate some of the sort of more Wes Anderson y kind of aesthetic type films, but in a much better way. Um, I thought it was good. Yeah, of course. I mean, there's stuff for Latrix. There's Latrix. stuff for Latrix over there. But yeah. yeah. Well, we've got still got a little bit of sunshine, so we'll talk about some music. Um, as an aside, I have just started on Spotify doing like my little earworms playlist, uh, like where I put together what I've been listening to in a, a given moment. So I've got one for. March, which is just for me, really. Um, but uh, I, but don't I, people want to follow it? Do I don't know. You probably it? don't want no. to. Uh, I don't know. Let me know if you do. Um, but um, uh, something I'll be doing, I guess, like going forward now, is just putting all the songs of that moment together in a playlist, which is a, a nice little time capsule, sort of looking back. But also, it's really nice to have all the songs I want to hear that are kind of stuck in my head all together in one playlist. I just put it on. Where'd you get that idea from? Sean. Yeah. Because so, what I've got on, play, uh, on on Spotify is that like, you know. I listen to lots of albums, but I, I make playlists. Generally, I do. I've got my years playlists, so like each year, and I've got um, styles playlists. I guess you know, so like a, a certain sort of theme or mood type playlist. But it's quite nice to just put anything I want that just that I want to listen to. It's like non curated. Non curated, which is yeah. hard for me to sort of. There's a breakaway, and it's a, yeah. it feels like a big step for me. Yeah. Um, I mentioned Maria McKee. Discovered her this year. She's great, isn't she? Brilliant. Um, particularly the uh, Life is Sweet album I've really, really gotten into. Uh, I've discovered Matthew Sweet out of nowhere. It's a big month of discoveries for me. I have to say, like, I've discovered some stuff that I just can't stop listening to. So Matthew Sweet is a kind of a power pop, I think it's called. I've, 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 I've got a few of his 90s albums now. I can show you if you like. Probably it's April Fool's Day today. Oh, is it? And Cookie Monsters oh, did yeah. an Instagram post that says, "Me thank me finally over cookies." <laughs> so yeah, Maria McKee. It's a Life Is Sweet, great album. Um, so, uh, so I uh, got her first one from the market. Um, not too sweet. Um, yeah. How did I go all these years without? Oh, I'm missing an album. Here. No. How did I go all these years without my few sweet? So I picked these all second uh, second hand for like a quid. Um, 100% fun. This, this is my favourite. I'm obsessed with um, Sick of Myself. I just cannot stop listening to that song. What a great song. What a great 90s album. But, you know, I, I kind of think of myself as like, I'm, I'm up for the 90s, but I'm not, clearly. Uh, this is uh, Altered Beast. Very 90s cover. Power pop, good guitar, melodic, great. And from 1999, in reverse. Pick this one up from the indoor market. Oh, so good. These are so good. I love Matthew Sweet. Just melodic guitar, pop. Something that, that has occurred to me uh, in the last days of the month was um, rediscovering the Human Touch album by Bruce Springsteen. Now, this is like, you know, the early 90s was not, it's not a, an era that Bruce fans would like sort of say is his best. 
Um, if, if you recall, in like, 92, I think, or 93, he released Human Touch and uh, Lucky Town on the same day. So two albums. And Human Touch is a long album as well. Um, and they're both, you know, kind of not regarded as his great stuff, you know. Um, but I sort of rediscovered Human Touch recently. I found it really interesting. And I've sort of been looking... Um, into kind of the uh, sort of a lot of queer theory around Bruce Springsteen as a result because that era and especially the Human Touch album and the lyrics and the songs in that, that album have definitely have some sort of you know it appears to be queer coded I, that could just be me looking into it but there's, a, there's some sort of hyper masculine kind of uh, tropes going on there and fascinating really interesting I, you know, I I remember the the Human Touch video coming out as a kid and thinking this is pretty cool. If you watch it now, it's just like him with just like a leather waistcoat, <laughs> tight jeans, you know, a bit of a bandana. What I've done, you'll be interested to hear, is I've created my own single album out of those two albums, uh, including some of the outtakes which never appeared on either of those albums. I've made it here. It's called Caviar and Dirt. What I've done is I've made it even more gay. <laughs> I, um, I've included the song My Lover Man on there and I've put like, you know, A Man's Job. I, I've sort of really gone for that, how I see that album should have been. Um, and Caviar and Dirt is a lyric from Better Days, um, from uh, the uh, Lucky Town album. Let me know if you want <laughs> some more info on that. We love Bruce around here. I've been obsessed with because uh, no one asked me about my films on this. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. I've been obsessed with that Nick Cave. Nick Cave. Song. Sean's been obsessed with Nick Cave. I haven't well, given it a proper listen, so I, it's I, just one song. I, yeah. There's no album yet, is there? No. But I can't stop listening to it. Wild God by Nick Cave. You heard that one? I love it. I've put it on my 2024 playlist, but I haven't probably heard it yet. So I listen to it over and over again in rows. Some of my favourite stuff from now that's come just come out, like the Hooray for the Riff Raff album, is great. Really loving it. It's got a very kind of um, Waxahachi. St. Cloud kind of feel to it. Um, loving the song Hawk Moon, especially. I've been playing quite a lot. So, Hooray for Riff Raff are always really good, but I really like this album. Um, the Dear Lady, um, I can't remember the names. It's a collaboration between um, two musicians. I've got one of their sort of solo albums. Um, indigenous American um, women. It's kind of just sort of indie guitar stuff, but it's so good. Um, and Seeing Two, the song Seeing Two is incredible. I've been playing it over and over again this month. That's my music updates. We've been going on for quite a while now, so uh, I'll call it a day there. Um, that was excellent. Thank you for tolerating me. Um, I'll tolerate Put down any of your sort of new discoveries, music, writers, films, anything um, down below. Uh, yeah, thanks for watching.